Liberty today. Um, I view him personally as the continuation of Murray Rothbard in human form uh, today. Um, and basically, Murray is a continuation of the studies of Mises. So, uh, Walter is a living legend, and I'm very honored to have Walter Flock speak with us this morning. Boy, I'd better give a good speech after that. <laughs> I've been asked to speak about privatization. But before I do, I just wanted to mention something that Bumper mentioned. Um, I don't know if he'd agree with me or not, but I think we need a little bit more nuance about open borders. Let me take a little survey here. Uh, I'll give you two choices, open borders or uh, uh, regulated borders where we pick and choose which immigrants we get. How many say open borders? How many say we pick and choose which immigrants we get? Wow, this is a total open borders group. I'm amazed. Because among the veterans, there are debates. There is divisiveness. One of them is uh, abortion versus, you know, uh, pro-life versus pro-choice. Another is open borders versus regulated borders. Just out of curiosity, how many uh, favor uh, pro-life versus pro-choice? Pro-life, raise your hand. Pro-choice? Okay, so we have some divisiveness there. Well, I am also open borders, as is Bumper, but I wanted to add something. See, the, the way I see the debate among libertarians and among everyone else is the open borders people think that all the immigrants are sort of good guys, or if they're not all good guys, well, then they're no worse than the extant people that are here already. Whereas the people who want to regulate uh, borders uh, see a lot of uh, bad guys out there. And I uh, take a, a moderate view, that's why they call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> I uh, believe that there are a lot of bad guys out there, and yet I'm for open borders. So who are the bad guys? You know, uh, there was a, uh, a suicide hotline, and somebody called in the suicide hotline, they said, can you drive a truck? Well, what's going on? Why do they want to know if you can drive a truck? Because there are truck fugees, namely refugees who get in a truck with a whole bunch of dynamite and then blow up as many people as they can. Uh, in uh, Sweden and Germany, uh, women now feel constrained to wear head, uh, head coverings because if you don't wear head coverings, uh, some of these immigrants think of women who wear miniskirts or no head coverings as, uh, as immoral and need to be punished, and the way to be punished is to be raped. So there are truck refugees, rape refugees. There are some really bad guys out there that we don't really want. And even if they were all good guys, there are seven billion people on this earth now, seven and a half billion. Suppose five billion of them came here. Do we really want five billion people even if they're good people? Well, maybe, maybe not. So how do we have our cake and eat it? How do we have the libertarian theory of open borders plus safety? and plus not being crowded. Well, first let me make the case that open borders are the libertarian view. Because suppose somebody comes from, I don't know, Mongolia or Mars or Africa and starts homesteading land that's never been homesteaded before in the middle of um, Alaska or in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming. Did he commit a crime? Well, not according to libertarianism. Therefore, anyone who stops him is a criminal. Therefore, open borders are the libertarian view. But we don't want to stop there. We don't want to just say open borders. And I think, I don't know if Bumper would agree with me or not. Uh, he didn't have enough time to elaborate on this, but I'll elaborate, uh, give my view on this. Who's we, Bumper? We, I'm sorry? Who's Bumper? Bumper? Jacob. 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 the previous speaker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, everyone calls him that. I, I didn't even know his first name. I guess Jacob. But, but thanks for uh, helping me out here. I thought everyone knew him. Thanks, Walter. Okay. <laughs> Walter is pretty famous. So how do we have our cake and eat it? How do we have safety plus? Well, the way we do it is we homestead every square inch of the, uh, the land and of the water. And then if somebody comes in here without permission, without an invitation, he's a trespasser. So that, I think, is a more sophisticated uh, libertarian view on open borders. And the open borders plus private property. 
Well, this sort of segues in, into my, uh, my topic of private property. Why should we have private property? Why should we privatize every square inch of, of all the land and all the water and, and everything else? Well, there are two reasons. One reason is ethics. If the government owns stuff, then uh, we don't have as much freedom as we would otherwise have if we owned stuff. Because then these people, criminals, tell us what to do. So, uh, Private property rights are justified on the grounds that we don't want to have government telling us what to do. And it's also in terms of efficiency. We will be a lot more efficient, we'll have a much more efficient economy with privatization rather than government running things. Why is this? Well, there are a whole host of reasons. One is, if government owns all the means of production, which is socialism, there are no prices, uh, no market prices, no prices that indicate scarcity and desire, scarcity, the supply side, supply curve, uh, desire, the demand side. We just don't have any prices. We don't know whether we should put a tunnel through the mountain or a road around the mountain. We don't know if we should use uh, platinum for railroad ties or steel. Platinum is better, but maybe we shouldn't use it because it's so valuable we can't waste it on, on uh, on um, railroad ties. Uh, we don't know squat. We're, we're planning in a vacuum or uh, with any, without any knowledge. So that's one reason. Another reason is in the marketplace under privatization, people can go broke. The reason we have pretty good wristwatches and pretty good shirts and pretty good shoes and pretty good chairs and pretty good food is because anyone who produces something that isn't all that good loses money. And after a while, they go broke and they have to do something else. So the people who remain are pretty good. Not excellent, not perfect. The human condition, perfection is denied us. We're on the wrong side of the Garden of Eden. But things are pretty good in the market. Whereas in the government case, if they screw up, and people do screw up, we're all human, they don't go broke. Look, um, take the FAA. There are now these uh, airplanes that uh, fell down in, in uh, Africa. And the FAA did not ban the airplane for a while. Will the FAA go broke? No, the FAA can't go broke. It's a government enterprise. Might Boeing go broke? Yes, it's possible. So that's, that's a very different kind of a thing. Uh, the um, Food and Drug Administration didn't go broke when they approved the thalidomide, which uh, created uh, babies uh, with uh, malfunctions. The pharmaceutical companies can go broke. Airplane companies can go broke. If you look at the Fortune 500 for the last 10, 20, 30 years, you're going to see a big difference. Namely, people go broke if they don't do a good job. But did the post office go broke? Does the Social Security go broke? No. So those are the reasons why we should have privacy. One, ethics. Two, economic efficiency. Now what I want to do is to apply that to three books that I've done. I've done three books in this series. I'm sort of into series. Uh, one of my series is, is um, Defending the Undefendable. I did Defending the Undefendable 1, and now I'm Defending the Undefendable 2, and I'm working on 3. I have this, I don't know, uh, weird series orientation. Well, I had the same thing with privatization. I have three books on that, and I'm working on a fourth now. The three books are Privatizing Roads, Streets, and Highways, which book I didn't bring because I don't have enough of them. But I have the other two. Here is space capitalism, why we should privatize the space race and privatize the moon and Mars. And here is water capitalism, the case for privatizing oceans, rivers, lakes, and aquifers. I wanted to put mud puddles in there, but the publisher didn't want that. Publishers are mean. So let me go over these three books. What I want to make the claim is we should privatize roads, streets, and highways. We should privatize all bodies of water, and we should privatize the moon and the Mars and uh, the space race. <coughs> Why did I write the one on, on roads? Two motivations. One, do you know how many people die on the, on the nation's highways every year? It's something like 40,000. Sometimes it's 41, sometimes it's 37, but you know, for the last 10, 20, 30 years, it's been around 40,000. To just put that number in context, 
How many people died in 9-11? Only a stinking lousy 3,000? How many people died in Katrina? Only 1,900 people? Just the other day, there was a, uh, a synagogue shooting and one person was killed and everyone was all upset about that, properly so, because every life is precious, especially every innocent life is precious. This is 40,000, and yet you don't hear a squat. Nobody says boo. Nobody writes, well, you know, there's this gigantic death rate of people dying on the highways. And that's one reason that I, I wrote this, and my, my understanding is that if we had competition, just as we have competition in tablecloths and chairs and shoes and, uh, and light bulbs, we'd maybe reduce the death rate. And my estimation was, what I did is I did some uh, statistical uh, surveys. I compared government and, and markets in terms of <coughs> cases where both operate. For example, garbage removal. And my understanding and the evidence showed that uh, it costs roughly three to four to five times as much to remove a ton of garbage from the government as private. And also post office. It, it costs uh, about three or four times more for the uh, government to deliver a letter than for a private to deliver a letter, mainly because of you know exit. Because if you don't do a good job, you lose money and you have to go broke. So the remaining people are pretty good, whereas it doesn't work in government. So I extrapolated. I said, well, if government is, uh, say, four times more efficient, then maybe instead of 40,000 people dying, 10,000 people will die, which is an improvement. I mean, not that I favor 10,000 people dying, but we save 30,000 people. That was my rough ex uh, uh, implication of this analysis, namely on, on uh, taking area, uh, evidence from other areas and applying it to to uh, roads and extrapolate it. Well, why? Why would, why would we be safer if we had private roads? And half of the book is just explanations as to why this could be, and I'll give you two or three or four examples. And then the other half of the book is objections. You know, if you had private roads, somebody would build a road around your house and not let you out or stuff like that. And just tons of objections, and I try to refute all of them. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of each. Right now, on the highway, uh, there's Highway 10 that runs right, right by uh, New Orleans and Highway 55, not too far away. The minimum speed law is 40 and the maximum is 70. If you do 70, what happens to you? Most people sort of creep right by you because they're doing 75, right? Well, maybe it would be better, instead of having 40 and 70, that each lane had its own speed limit. Mainly, the, the right-hand lane should do 55, the middle lane 70, and the left lane 85. Or maybe it should be 60, 70, and 80. I don't know. I'm not a road theoretician. I'm a, an economist. And what I say is competition brings about a better product. And I'm thinking, well, could we do it a little differently? And on my road, I might try uh, 55, uh, 70, and, and 80. And then if it worked, I would say, hey, come to my road. Don't go to my competitor's road, which is death, charnel house, whatever. <laughs> you come to my road, you're safer. Well, that's one way that roads could be uh, safer. Another way, you know, every once in a while there's some idiot in the left lane doing 55. <laughs> that's perfectly legal. And everybody has to go around him. And maybe lane changing creates more deaths. So uh, I would deal very severely with a guy in the left lane who was uh, going very slowly. Another one, think of a, a two-lane highway. A lot, a lot of times it's three lanes, sometimes it's two lanes. And you see truck A and truck B, and you know truck B is gonna pass truck A, and you know it's gonna take about 15 minutes to do it. So what I do is I go up to about 90 <laughs> to, to get past truck B before he pulls out to pass, well, that's dangerous. You know, I shouldn't be doing that, but you know, I don't want to wait 15 minutes for the guy to pass. So on my road, I would um, have, uh, you know, that, that truck A should let the guy get past, and if he makes him wait 15 minutes, I'm gonna give him a big ticket. Another uh, idea was, whenever there's a death, uh, you put a cross or a Jewish star or a Muhammad, whatever it is, right there, and I'm not talking about three feet high, I'm talking about 50 feet high to indicate that this is a, a, a dangerous area. So I have whole bunches of uh, suggestions as to how roads could be safer. And um, I, I think 
I have a problem with that. You know, there's this guy, Bob Poole from Reason, Reason Magazine. Have you heard of him? What he does is he consults with government and suggests things like this. And I think that's improper for a libertarian. We're not, we're not supposed to try to make government more efficient. Government is evil. We want to get rid of it. And he's consulting with them to try to show them how to do it better. This is my analysis of Milton Friedman, an efficiency expert for the state, half libertarian, half efficiency expert for the state. What Bob Poole is doing, I think, is improper. Well, then how do I justify me doing roughly the same thing? Well, if I write a book and um, I send it out to hopefully libertarians and the government reads it, well, you know, what the heck? I, I can't be blamed for that. So that's my excuse. <laughs> I'm not consulting with them. I'm writing a book as to how private roads would work. And if they read it and they implement it, well, you know, it's not my fault. Another motivation for writing this book was congestion. I used to live in New York City. I now live in New Orleans. The rush hour is pretty grim. I don't know how it is here, but it's a pretty big city, so probably there's a heavy rush hour. And what they should do is have peak load pricing. We have peak load pricing all over the place. Um, the ski resorts charge more in the summer, in, in winter than in the summer, right? Uh, people charge more for dinner than for lunch. Uh, because more people uh, want to use these things at certain peaks, well, you just charge more. So Bob was telling him to do that, which will make the highways more efficient, but uh, he, he shouldn't be doing it. Okay, so those are the two motivations for writing the book. And then there's a whole bunch of objections. One of the objections is, um, well, somebody's going to build a, a the, you're going to have your house here, and there'll be four roads around your block, and, and they're going to say, okay, you want to get out onto our road, it's going to be a million dollars each time. Well, the, the answer to that objection is, look, the road owner wants people to build houses on his road. If nobody built a, a house on his road, he couldn't charge much to anyone. So he would have an incentive to lure you in there by contractually obligating himself not to do any such thing. So that would be uh, the answer to that objection. Then there's the question of uh, eminent domain. Do we need eminent domain to build a road? Suppose we want to build a road from here to, I don't know, um, uh, Chicago. How many people own land between here and Chicago? A lot of people. There's always going to be a holdout. We try to get the road, you know, by this land, by that land. My favorite example of the holdout is uh, Cartman from South Park. Are you people into Cartman in South Park? It's a very libertarian show. You, you really should uh, get into that. And, uh, you know, and, and Cartman's uh, motto is screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys. Yeah. So, you know, we want to buy land, and Cartman happens to own uh, land right in the path of where we're going to uh, build our road. So, my son and I, when he was around 15, we discussed nothing but this for about two years. <laughs> and we finally decided what you could do is build under him or a bridge over him. And there's this doctrine called ad colum. Ad colum means if you own land, you own down to the core of the earth and up into the heavens. But that's not libertarian. Libertarianism is homesteading. And, and Cartman didn't mix his labor with land 3,000 feet below or 50,000 feet above. So that's a crazy doctrine. Think of what it would do for air travel. Every time you go over to some guy's farm in an airplane, you have to pay him. <coughs> crazy. So uh, we finally wrote that, and I wrote the whole thing, but it was based on a discussion, and we published it. My son said, well, you know, you shouldn't make me the co-author, because who would believe that I did? And I said, well, I don't care if anybody believes anything. I, I care, well, did, you, uh, did we work on this together? He said, of course we did. We discussed nothing but this for the last three years. So then Gordon Tullock, a very famous <laughs> economist, wrote an article saying that the blocks, my son and I, were you know, all wrong, and then I wrote an article uh, saying why he was wrong, and that's in my book on, on private roads. Okay, the second book in this series is Water Capitalism, and by the way, these books are for sale out there on the, uh, on the, on the table, 20 bucks each, and uh, if you buy one, I will give half of the money to to the Florida Libertarian Party. So. so please buy some of these books. They're very heavy to bring here. <laughs> I want to go back lighter. Okay, so what's going on with this book? 
uh, water capitalism. Why do I want to privatize bodies of water? And now you've got this pinko, um, what's his name, uh, Robert Nozick? I'm kidding. He, Robert Nozick is one of the, our most famous libertarian philosophers. You've all heard of Robert Nozick? Yeah. yeah. And what he, uh, he's a little pinko on this issue. Uh, he's great on most things, but he, he had this crap about if you pour your can of um, uh, tomato juice into the ocean, do you own the ocean or do you just waste your tomato juice? And you can't privatize oceans. Well, I think you can. I think we should. I think uh, private property is better than uh, either public property or non-ownership. We, we just discussed the problem with government ownership. What's the problem with non-ownership where uh, the, the ocean is like that and many rivers and lakes and stuff like that? Although the, the rivers and lakes within the United States are claimed by the government. Well, the problem with non-ownership is a thing called the tragedy of the commons. If nobody owns anything privately, but we all own it together, we tend not to take care of it. Think of the buffalo and the cow. The cow never went within a million miles of extinction because we always owned it privately. The buffalo almost went extinct because nobody could own them. The law was against you couldn't own buffalo. Now, happily, we can own buffalo, so the buffalo is safe. The point is, if you kill a cow, you slaughter the cow, what's the cost to you of that? Well, you could have had the cow tomorrow, so it's a pretty hefty cost, and you'll be careful in slaughtering cows. If buffalo are not allowed to be owned and you kill one, would you have had one tomorrow? No, you, he would be in the next county. So you'll kill him uh, if the value to you of him is uh, you know, more than the cost of killing him. So that's why the, the buffalo were going extinct. That's why the alligators were going extinct. We want alligators too for their skin and stuff. Um, uh, the, the elephant and the rhino are just big cows with funny looking noses. <laughs> the reason that they're going extinct is they're not privately owned. And the same thing with the cod and the whales. The reason that the whales are going extinct and, and the, the fish are going extinct is overfishing. And we have to have fishing seasons. We don't have to have shirt seasons. We don't have to have shoe seasons where you're only not allowed to make shoes or shirts on, on, in, on March or April or something like that. And that's what they do with fish, which is a, a lunatic kind of an idea. Another point, I was talking about deaths in uh, Katrina. Katrina really missed us in New Orleans. It missed us by 40 miles and went east of us. Why then did 1,900 people die? Because the levees in the Mississippi River fell. And who made the levees? The Army Corps of Engineers. And what's happening with the Army Corps of Engineers that created 1,900 deaths needlessly? They are still in business. Now look, the, the uh, humanity part of me says, well, 1,900 people died, that's horrible. The economist in me says, eh, who cares about deaths? The fact is they're still in business. That's horrible. <clears throat> so we should privatize the Mississippi River. How would we privatize the Mississippi River? Well, uh, we, uh, we libertarians believe in non-aggression principle and private property rights. We have to have both because, uh, you know, suppose I punch this guy over here. Did, did I um, violate his rights? Well, it depends on who owns him. If he owns himself, then I'm a criminal. If I own him somehow, voluntary slavery. <laughs> you people into voluntary slavery? My son, God forbid, has a dread disease and it'll cost 10 million to fix him up. And you people have long wanted to be, uh, me to be your servant on your plantation. And uh, we make a deal. Give me 10 million, I'll give it to my son's doctors, they'll save his life, and I'll be your slave. You, and with every voluntary contract, there's mutual gain in the ex ante sense. I benefit because I value my son's life more than my freedom. You value because you benefit because you value my servitude more than the 10 million. You're very rich. So there's mutual benefit. So if I own him and then I can punch him, that's okay. But he owns himself. Or now he's got a nice yellow tie and I'm going to grab that yellow tie. If he stole it from me yesterday, well, then I'm just repossessing my private property. And if not, I mean, I never saw the time before it's his, then I'm a thief if I grab it. So if you're going to have the non-aggression principle, you also have to have private property rights. So how do we get private property rights? We homestead it. That's the, the Lockean and Rothbardian uh, view. Well, so who homesteaded the Mississippi River? The people who had all those boats going up and down, the people who owned land on the side of it, 
and maybe there are 100,000 people and they each get one share. So now we have Mississippi River Corporation owned by 100,000 people, one share each, and it's uh, traded on the stock market, and, and that's it. And that would be the same way we would privatize the highways or the roads. Whoever mixed his labor with it. We wouldn't be auctioning anything off. We wouldn't auction off the roads or the bridges. Because if you auction it, who gets the money? The government. And we don't want the government to have money. They have enough money already. They should have less money. They should have no money, if you take the anarchist uh, view. Well then, if the Mississippi River Corporation screwed up and, and the levees poured out into, the, into New Orleans and other places, well, they'd go broke and we'd have new management. So that's pretty much in a, uh, in a five minute version of what's going on in this book. We should privatize everything. If it moves, privatize. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Everything either moves or doesn't move. So we privatize everything. That's my motto. Okay, the third book in this series is a thing called Space Capitalism, and I should say that both of these books are co-authored by me and Peter Nelson. The first book on roads I, I wrote by myself, with a little help from my son. So what's going on in space capitalism? Why do I want to privatize space? Why do I want to privatize the moon? Why do I want to privatize Mars? Why do I want to promote exploration? Well, some of my best friends are human beings, and I like human beings, and I'm afraid that we're going to blow ourselves up here because of governments. Uh, this guy, uh, Rummel, uh, did a wonderful book about uh, death by government. I forget the exact title. It's something like that. Democide. Uh, sorry, Democide. That was one of his books. He had three or four books, all mentioning the point that in the last century, governments killed something like 250 million people. And that's apart from wars, just the internal killing. Government is you know, not, a good, not a good group. <laughs> so they're, they're, there's a big risk of blowing ourselves up. And if we blow ourselves up on Earth and we have some colonies on the moon and Mars, then at least human beings will go on, and I like the idea of human beings going on. So that's one motivation for it. Another one is economics. You know, there's resources out there. Asteroids are full of uh, platinum or rare earth materials or whatever. So we should promote that, or at least uh, we, should, we should get the government out of it and see if private enterprise wants to. So. We should privatize not only the moon and Mars, but we should privatize the space race. Well, what about the fact that the first people on the moon were uh, government employees? Should they homestead stuff? And the idea of homesteading is the more fertile the land is, the less you have, the less you have to do and the fewer years you have to do it for. So east of the Mississippi, the land is fertile. The natural law kind of a thing was 160 acres for four people because that's all you needed and that's all a family of four could do. West of the Mississippi, a little less fertile. 1,600 acres was Murray Rothbard's guess as to what would be appropriate. Well, if you're gonna homestead the Sahara Desert or the middle of Alaska, then even more with less work. And it's a continuum problem. You, you can't say, well, you know, this is exactly how much you have to do. Sort of similar to the, um, what is it, statutory rape law. We know that if you go to bed with a five-year-old girl, you are a statutory rapist, even if she agreed. Because we don't think five-year-old girls can agree to any such thing. You go to bed with a 25-year-old woman and she agrees. Well, you're not a statutory rapist because we think she's an adult. Well, where do you draw the line? 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, but any, any point you draw, somebody's gonna say, well, why not one month older or younger? So you really don't have any um, libertarian or any other philosophy that says, well, this is a cutoff point. Well, it's the same thing with homesteading. We have this idea that the more you, uh, uh, the more hostile the land is, the, the more you get for a given amount of work. Okay, so the moon, well, how much do they, suppose it was a private person that went to the moon, how much would he get, the whole moon? No, that's too much. The, the, a quarter of it, that's probably too much also, but you know, maybe 10 square miles, even though they only occupied an acre or so. But the problem is that the person who did that was a government. And government is criminal, if you take the anarchist, uh, let me just uh, uh, take another survey. I'm gonna give you four choices. Anarcho-capitalism, minarchism, where the government is armies, courts, and police. Constitutionalism, where we go by the Constitution as interpreted by Judge Napolitano or Ron Paul. And then the fourth would be classical liberalism. 
Kursk, where uh, Friedman and Hayek have a lot more for the government to do. How many are anarcho-capitalists here? Wow, that's amazing. How many are minarchists, sort of like Ayn Rand? A few. How many are constitutionalists? Fewer and fewer. And how many are classical liberals of Hayek, Friedman? Not a, not a one. Wow, this is a radical group. <laughs> I should be more radical. I've been uh, too, uh, too moderate here. <laughs> We like to get up early. Okay. <laughs> well, if you take the anarchist point of view, which I do, then uh, they're a criminal group and they can't homestead anything. They should be in jail. So they don't own anything. But if they were private, they would own 10 square miles or whatever. And similarly on Mars. So that would be one aspect of it. The other aspect would be, well, the space race. And uh, right now it's government mainly in charge, except for a few people like Elon Musk. And Elon Musk has done great yeoman work. You know, before Elon, the way that they would work things is you shoot a rocket up into the air, and it comes down, and, it, and you lose the rocket. Now, I just took a plane from uh, New Orleans here. Imagine if we did that with airplanes. You take the plane from New Orleans here, and then you have to get rid of the airplane. Do you know how much, uh, how costly air travel would be if every time you took off, that was it for the plane? So thank God for Elon Musk. Uh, he uh, concocted a way to save the plane or to save the rocket ship, so you could use it again a few times. I mean, uh, you know, demand curves slope downward. The more expensive it is, the less you're going to do, even for government. There are limitations. So uh, he's a great guy. On the other hand, he takes money from government. A lot of the money he takes from government uh, for, for, his, uh, for his various projects. So should we take, what's the libertarian view on taking money from government? Take all of it. The, I'm sorry? Take all of it. Yes, that's my man. Yes. The libertarian, look, they're a bunch of criminals. We should relieve them of their ill-gotten gains. Right? Uh, look. I used to work for a public university. I worked for a private one, Loyola University in New Orleans. By the way, a commercial announcement, I'm a professor there, and all four of our econ people are free enterprise, so if you're a, uh, you're a high school student and listening to this, or you're a grandfather and you have a high school student and you're thinking of which college should they go to, come to Loyola University New Orleans. Um, look, we have plenty of pinko commies there, like everywhere else, but at least we have some free enterprise people. The whole economics department is that way, so that might be a good place for you to come. Okay, back off the commercial message now. Where was I? Elon Musk. Elon Musk, right, thanks. I'm, I'm an absent-minded professor, can't help myself. So it's good to take money from government. I taught at a public university, and I took money from government. We all use the uh, public streets to get here. We all have um, uh, cash, uh, government currency in our wallets. We, we sometimes go to a museum or a park. Uh, uh, I go to Audubon Park in New Orleans, and you now it's a government park. It's okay to take money from government. But now, look, Ragnar Damagecold, my favorite character in, in Atlas Shrugged, took money from government. <laughs> Right? So there's nothing wrong with taking money from government. So is Elon Musk okay or not? Well, the way my co-author and I figured this out is, well, if he's one of us, then it's okay for, it's okay for libertarians to take money from government, but not Connie Pinkos. Because <laughs> they're, they're part of government. <laughs> so the question is, well, which way is Elon Musk? So what my co-author and I did is we went over all of Elon Musk's speeches to see if he's a good guy or not, and unfortunately he's not a good guy, so we're, we were against him. But there's nothing wrong per se with taking money from government. Okay, I've been told to go for a half hour and then do a Q&A for 15 minutes, so I've now finished my half hour, and now I open the floor for comments. Yes, sir? Could you get more into like, privatization in Mississippi and, and, and what, like, what the process would be to get to that point, please? What would be the process of getting the privatization for the Mississippi River? Well, I indicated very slightly, but now I can go into it in more depth. The idea is we don't, we don't sell the Mississippi River, we don't auction it off, because if we auction it off, we auction it off, it would be government auctioning it off, it's, it's, it's river, and then the government would have more money and we don't want that. So who then would get to own the Mississippi River? The people who use it. The people who swim in it, the people who uh, fish in it, the people who have boats going up and down it, the people who own land on the side of it on the grounds that presumably they use it a little bit. 
So if there are a million people that use the Mississippi River in this way, uh, and each one got one chair, well then uh, that's the Mississippi River Corporation. I used to work in Canada for the Fraser Institute in British Columbia, and there was this thing called BRIC, British Columbia Resources Investment Corporation, BCRIC. And what it was was a whole bunch of uh, forestry things, uh, uh, forest ownership and, and um, uh, quarries and, and all sorts of stuff. And then a pretty much a right wing or a free market uh, government came in. I shouldn't say right wing because I don't think that we libertarians are right wing nor left wing. I think we're unique. We're neither of the right nor the left. But this was a, a conservative government and they were pretty good on economics. And what they did is they privatized it. They privatized all the brick holdings. And they did it very well. Uh, they just said every uh, uh, taxpayer in British Columbia gets one share of brick. Uh, unfortunately, they said nobody could have more than 2% two, two of it, and nobody could buy and sell shares to get more than 2% of it. What the heck? At least they privatized it. So I would do a similar sort of thing like that. And maybe uh, give a share to everybody who lives within um, 10 miles of the Mississippi River. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly how to do this. Um, that would be a difficult thing, you know, what's fair, what's just. It's, it's hard to unscramble an egg. <laughs> what we're trying to do is unscramble eggs here. Uh, we just have to do the best we can. And, you know, anything we do, somebody can say, well, this guy should have had a share, or that guy should have had a share and didn't get it. What the heck, you know, we, we have to do the best we can. So then the Mississippi River Corporation would uh, be owned by uh, a million share owners and it would be traded on the stock market like any other corporation. And um, if they did a good job, they'd make profits and they did a bad job, they'd make losses. And they would be part of the private nexus. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was gonna say, we actually got this going on in Florida now. I'm not real familiar with all the details, but uh, most of the use of beaches in Florida are governed under, I believe they refer to it as historical use. And that's why we can pretty much walk on the beach and we're, we're at and continue to walk on the beach regardless of, of what's on the shoreline. The, uh, the state of, there is lawsuits right now up in Walton County that are attempting to establish that the land owner owns all the way to that mean high water, mean basically what they're trying to establish is you can no longer walk to the beach. There are areas in Walton County that they're putting up ropes and people are cutting them down. And uh, so they're trying, and there's a test case. I'm not real familiar with all of this, okay? But I will say that the lawyers are from South Florida, okay? And uh, it was a little doubt in my mind that once this test case gets through, if they're able to persevere up in Walton County, then you're going to go ahead and have this start spreading throughout the state. And there's going to be the loss of historical use uh, approach. And you will no longer be able to go to the beach unless it's a dedicated public beach. So this, uh, I understand where you're coming from with the home city, but you know, there are some, some aspects as to what you know, where this could lead to. So it's going to be loss of freedom to use the beach, okay, with, with you might say, the, the, this privatization that they're trying to do of returning the beaches to the landowners. So. That's a very important and very interesting question. Let me just repeat it because uh, people in, in the radio land or TV land might not have heard that. Uh, what this gentleman is saying is that there's a, a if I can put words in your mouth, that there's a dispute over what to do with Floridian beaches. Should it be open to all comers, or should the people who own the property there get to be the owners of it, and if, if so, they would put ropes on and keep everyone out? Well, I think I, I take the opposite point of view of you. See, if everyone owns it, then no one owns it, and then you have the tragedy of the commons. My claim would be that if you had privatization, however the privatization was, forget about how it was for the moment, then someone would take care of it and would charge money for entrance into it. 
So it's not as if if I, if I own a, a quarter mile of beach, I, I would keep it for myself. Maybe I would if I'm very, very rich. But maybe what I would do, and probably many people would do, is I'd say, okay, you want to come in here? It's 25 a day or, or uh, 300 a year or, or whatever the thing is. It would be sort of like Disneyland. Can everyone go to Disneyland or Disney World? No. You want to go to Disneyland or Disney World? You have to pay them. And there's nothing wrong with paying them. Whereas if uh, Disneyland were uh, open to everybody and anyone could come, uh, pretty soon you wouldn't want to go there because you'd have the tragedy of the Congress. So uh, I, I, I sense your concern that people can't go to the beach, but I would just say if it were privately owned and people wanted to go to the beach, entrepreneurs who own the beach would say, yeah, come on in, and I'll keep the beach clean, and I'll make sure there's no glass here, and uh, whatever it is, and, and I'll charge you for it. Nothing wrong with charging uh, for amenities. Uh, we want to bring it into the private nexus, so that would be my response to that. Young man over here. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, as your thinking evolved over time, and I assume so, but uh, where did you start, and uh, what caused you to change? Well, uh, I was brought up in Brooklyn, and I'm Jewish, and therefore I was a pinko commie socialist. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I was on the high school track team with Bernie Sanders. He and I were buddies. We would walk to school together. We're, we're still sort of friendly. And I had roughly the same views as him. And then Ayn Rand came to Brooklyn College. I overlapped with Bernie for four years in high school and one year at Brooklyn College. I stayed on, he went off uh, the University of Chicago. Ayn Rand came to lecture and I came to boo and hiss her because she favored free enterprise. And everyone knows that free enterprise means death to babies in the street and you know poverty and, and unfairness. And it was just horrible. So I came and booed her and hissed her. And then after the lecture, uh, they announced that the Ayn Rand study club that had invited her was having a lunch in her honor and anyone could come even if you disagreed. I want to show her that socialism is the way to go. So it was this long, long table, maybe 100 people on each side, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of it, and Nathaniel Brandon and uh, Peacock and Alan Greenspan, and I was relegated to the other end of the table. And I turned to my neighbor and I said, hey, uh, capitalism sucks, you know, free enterprise is no good, it's fascism, uh, you know, the usual crap. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't really know that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I was a chutzpahnik, pushy, still am. And I, st I was about 20 years old, 19, I was a junior in college. Uh, Brandon was maybe 35, ran 50, and I stuck my head in between there, and I said, there's someone here who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And I said, who? And I said, me. And Brandon was very gentle and very nice. He said, look, I'll come to the other end of the table. There's no room here. And we'll discuss this on two conditions. One, you don't allow the conversation to lapse with this one discussion. But we keep going until we settle this. And two, you read two books that I'll recommend. The two books were Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hasler, which is a magnificent book. My Defending the Unoffendable is my homage to uh, Hasler. Hasler had one theory and 30 illustrations. My Defending books have the same sort of a thing. And I, I read the books, and um, I went to Brandon's house, I went to uh, Rand's house, and I was converted. I, I, I really wasn't a Randroid, I wasn't a cultist, because they were sort of weird, you know, the, the Randians. If you ask Rand a nice question, she'll say, give you an answer, but if you ask her a tough question, she'll kick you out. She'll say, get out. Uh, and then what happened is uh, my friend Larry Moss, uh, was a fellow student of mine at Columbia getting a PhD, and he said, you gotta meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. And I said, but Murray Rothbard's an anarchist. Uh, I don't wanna meet him, you know, he's crazy. <laughs> and finally, he prevailed upon me, and I met Murray Rothbard, and that's sort of a two-minute uh, history of how I got here. Yeah, yes, sir? Can you tell us a little bit more about your last conversations with uh, Murray Sanders? Like, what, what is your relationship not like as the two of you have grown so far apart. Well, he's a busy guy. And, uh, we don't really talk that much, but every five years we sort of uh, link up and we've agreed that we have different views. By the way, I invited uh, Ron Paul, the speaker at Loyola University, and I uh, believe in diversity. Not so much diversity of skin color, diversity of sex, race, whatever, but diversity of ideas. So guess who I invited to come speak at Loyola? My man Bernie. 
I, uh, he hasn't agreed yet, but I invited him. I invited Ron Paul. I want to show my students. You know, there are many different views, and uh, so we're sort of friendly acquaintances right now. If I can, uh, if I can characterize my relationship with him in that way. Uh, you know, I admire Bernie because he has the courage of his convictions. He's a, a socialist, and he, he never ran away from socialism. And he started in with socialism many years ago, before it was as popular as it is now. And he's also a big Democrat fan. We libertarians are not Democrat fans because we believe in democracy only if you agree to be bound by the vote in the first place. And we haven't been, we haven't agreed to be bound by the vote. But if you're in a chess club and you're debating, should we meet on Tuesday or Wednesday, and you've agreed to be bound by the vote, so there's nothing wrong with democracy per se. But he sees democracy in a very different way. And he says that the felons should be allowed to vote. And he doesn't run away from that. And that's going to cost them votes. You know, felons voting? Come on, give me a break. So I admire his courage, and I emulate him in that regard. Namely, I start with the non-aggression principle and private property rights based on homesteading, and I take it wherever it leads. So Bernie and I are buddies in that sense that we are rabid, uh, consistent, in terms of our principles, only I like my principles a little bit better than I like his principles. <laughs> I think we have time for one more comment, question. Yes, sir. I kind of have a comment. Could you stand up and speak a little louder? Sure. I kind of have a comment. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, to, to, but if it disagrees with me, I'll tell you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of grab the beach thing again, um, I. I, I remember that there's a lot, there's actually a lot of uh, privately owned parks, public, uh, sorry, sorry, there's a lot of privately owned parks, libraries, and and uh, services out there available for free, like I mean, YouTube, for example, that don't charge you directly with, but they can still make a profit. Maybe these um, um, aforementioned privately owned beaches could still make a profit without charging you by say advertising or or interviews and you and and you still have access to them but you also get the luxury of them being uh, taken care of since they're hardly young someone cares about them, you see what I mean? Right. Uh, this gentleman is saying that a lot of uh, private ownership, not all of it, they don't charge you anything. And the way they make their money is through advertising or uh, goodwill or, or something like that. And I think that's true. And, that I, and I, I stand corrected. I should have mentioned that when I discussed the, the, uh, the other point. Not everyone will charge you a fee like um, uh, uh, Disneyland or Disney World uh, or this hotel. It might be that they give it away for free, and a lot of um, uh, electronic things nowadays, they give it away for free, and uh, Tom Woods, who's gonna later be here speaking, has a blog where he gives a lot of stuff away for free, but he gets money through advertising. So that is another model, and uh, there's also lost leaders, like you go to a shopping mall, and they let you park for free because they want to encourage you to be there. They could have charged you to park there, but they don't. They, they don't charge us for these lights here or for cleaning the place. It's part of the, the fee. So I, I think that's a very good point, thank you. And thanks for your attention.